and uh, so good to have all of our guests and we've had a lot happening since 9:30 and 9 o'clock this morning and now I'm the last thing between you and whatever it is that you got in your mind because some of you have already made up your mind what you're going to eat. You know where you're going or you may have even already cooked it. It may be in a roast, you know, a pot roast just waiting for you at the house. But, uh, so I need to get right with it. But how many will agree to help me preach for a few minutes this morning? Amen. Judges 11 and 1. And uh, I began preparing and uh, prepared a message and went back to something I had preached one time before some years back. And when I began to look through it, it began to grow fresh and anew. And I said, well, most people are senile and they can't remember half of anything anyway. And then half the church wasn't even here when I preached it the first time. They need to hear it. But I did feel God pricking my heart in this direction. 11, Judges 11 and 1. Now Jephthah, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. And he was the son of an harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up. And they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob, and there were gathered vain men to Jephthah, and he and went out with him. Now, if you get to studying that, uh, it's more like men who were rough around the edges gathered themselves. Men who were tough and trying to make it in horrible, terrible circumstances. These, these are the kind of men that came to him in the land of Tom. And I want to preach to you this morning simply this, a name better than my circumstance. A name better than my circumstance. Let's pray one more time. Jesus, thank you for your divine touch and for your anointing and your presence that we felt all during this service. And now we ask you, God, one more time to anoint the lips of clay of your servant, the ears of your people, God, and we'll be careful to give you glory. Amen. Clap your hands before you're seated. Turn to somebody near you and say, you look good. Just make sure you turn to somebody that actually looks good. In the month of February 2002, the Congolese city of Goma had bedded down for the evening, and nearly half a million people probably drifted to sleep. And let me pause right here and say this. Brother Stanley's already said it, but I need to say it. It's good to have Brother and Sister Eric Davis with us this morning. And uh, they are in the area of affected. Many families in their church are affected by this fire. And they chose to come. They didn't have to. But they chose to come over here and be in service with us. And, and uh, they're doing a work for God. But this is one of ours. Amen. That, that, that we sent out. And we're happy to have them with us today. But here in the city of Goma. Nearly half a million people probably drifted off to sleep thinking it to be an ordinary night whatever else this night was it was not ordinary 
To the west of Goma was the Congo Republic. To the east lay war-torn Rwanda. And to the south, south is the placid Lake Kivu. And Goma's problem didn't come from the south, east, or west, but her nemesis that night emerged from the north. Twelve miles to the north towered Mount Niragongo. This mountain is part of the Virunga volcanic chain comprised of six extinct and two active volcanoes. And Goma's 12,000 foot tall neighbor was not of the extinct variety. The warning signs had been there. The animals had been acting strange. The water temperature in the lake had risen and its quality was poor. Yet it had been 25 years since the last eruption. And so that night Goma slept. In the middle of the night the volcano shook itself and awakened. The mountains exploded with a rain of lava and ash and three molten flows cascaded down its steep sides toward the town below. A stream of fire, 165 feet wide, roared toward Goma's, towards Goma, destroying everything in its path. It overran the town and unlike Ezekiel's prophetic stream that touched dead things and they lived... This river touched living things and they died. And about half of the city was destroyed. The people who could run did so. Some fled to the shore of the lake to catch a barge. Others raced on foot to Rwanda forming a teeming tide of human misery. And still others went into the Congo. And one of the refugees was an expectant young mother named Samir Azamu. And in the course of fleeing from the volcano, and all you mamas imagine this, she went into labor and delivered a baby boy along the roadside. The first five days of the infant's life were spent wrapped in a blanket at the shore of Lake Kivu awaiting a barge. His health is poor, she told a reporter. He does not breathe properly, and the bad smell of lava seems to have affected him. Nevertheless, Samir rocked her baby and sang a lullaby about the beautiful Congo, which now lay in ruins. And Samir named her baby Volcano. Forever he will be associated with the circumstances of his birth. She asked the reporter, she said, what other name could I have given him? And that question caught my attention. And as I thought about that question on this last Sunday in August, something began to stir on the inside of me. For there were many other names that she could have given her child. Many names that... Uh, that would have been better than the circumstances of his birth. One such name comes to mind and it's the name Jephthah. Just like the boy named Volcano. Jephthah was born into a bad circumstance. But there was a subtle difference that was not so subtle later on. He was given a name that was better than his circumstance. And in the scripture, names had meanings. From the first man named Adam, remembering the red dirt from which he was made. To the first woman named Eve, because she was to be the mother of all living. Names meant something in scripture. A biblical name made a statement about the nature of the person. And the, or the circumstances in which he was born. Isaac's name reflected his mother's laughter at his birth. Esau's name described his appearance. Jacob was named supplanter or deceiver because of his unusual clutching of his twin's brother's heel. And his subsequent life bore out these characteristics. 
Moses came by his name because he was drawn from the water. And the Bible says in Exodus 2 and 10, And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. You go look at the meaning of the name. And behind each name is a story. And there is a story about the meaning of Jephthah's name. His biography is similar to that one, one verse biography that Naaman had in 2 Kings 4. When it said Naaman, the Bible said, was a captain, a great man, a mighty man. But he was a leper. Come on, leprosy was such a great taboo in Bible days that it turned uh, princes into pariahs and kings into curses and emperors into exiles. And the Bible says, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of an harlot. And that was another taboo in the Bible days. From the world's oldest profession came the world's ancient curse. The child of a harlot was despised in those days something bad happened to Jephthah that it was of no fault of his own can I get a witness how many of you have ever found yourselves in circumstances that were not good but they were really no fault of your own and the circumstances of his birth was that he was the son of a harlot. Yet he was not named son of a harlot. He had to live with the ramification of the circumstances of his birth. Amen. But he didn't have to be named accordingly. And I'm not sure who named him. It could have been Gilead, his father, or his mother, the harlot. But the tradition, oh, modus operandi in these cases was that he was named by a faithful servant who was charged to, to care for the unwanted child but whoever it was uh, should be esteemed greatly among us because regardless of the circumstances of his birth they named him Jephthah which means this God will open a door or God will set me free Hallelujah. Today, no matter the circumstances of your birth, no matter the life of sin that you have lived prior to now, you've been given a name that changes your identity. You are no longer a child of a harlot. You're no longer the possession of Satan. You're no longer trapped in the circumstances that was beyond your control. But you're now a child of the king. And you wear a name. I said you wear a name that's better than your circumstances <laughs> hallelujah and instead of being defined or destroyed by the bad thing that has happened you can be distinguished by it so what are you trying to say, Brother Burks? I'm trying to say instead of you being defined by the fact that your daddy was an alcoholic, or should you, instead of you being defined that you have a family curse of immorality or dishonesty or whatever, you don't have to be defined by that. But you can be distinguished by it. When people can say, I know where he came from, but I want to tell you he is not like that because the circumstances of his birth are not the same as who he is. And he's got a name that's better than circumstances yeah. hallelujah oh. praise God all too often we let circumstances rule us praise God amen hallelujah in the name of Jesus whisper you know we hear these sounds whispers the child of a harlot they heard whispers he'll never amount to much call a child something low enough and they will begin to eventually believe it or live up to it Amen. I said you call a child something long enough and they will eventually begin to believe it and live up to it. That's why it's so important to be careful about what we say. Amen. Praise God. God can deliver us. Just like Gomer named her daughter Lo Ruama and her son Luami. Lo is a prefix meaning without. And these two children of a prostitute were, were, were named without a people and without compassion. Sometimes we let circumstances rule us. But through faith in God, we can triumph over these circumstances. Amen. 
Praise God. Jesus, when he was born of Mary, people must have whispered that she too was guilty of the same sin as Jephthah's mother. And yet Mary listened to the voice of the angel. You see, Mary was not yet married whenever she conceived of the Holy Ghost. It could have been voiced around and probably was that what is she doing with child because she has not married Joseph yet. But we know that it was a miraculous conception and it was ordained of God. She could have been ridiculed and and named Jesus. Jesus accordingly, but instead Mary listened to the voice of the angel who said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Great faith always gives children names better than their circumstances. I want to interject here and I want to charge every parent in this house to make a commitment that no matter what the circumstances that are in your life and in your child's life that you refuse to accept the name or the identity that the devil and the world would try to label your child. Amen. The enemy's calling them a drug addict. Amen. I said the enemy's calling them a drug addict but I want you to call them delivered. In Jesus' name. The world is labeling them as sexual deviant. But you call them purified by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. You need to let, let them know they have a name that don't, it's not the same as their circumstances. The enemy's calling them lost. But I want you to call them found. Amen. Amen. The enemy's called them in shambles and broken. But I want you to stand up and say, I call them fixed and repaired. In Jesus' name. The enemy's called them they'll never be anything. But I want you to call them they're going to be called and fulfilled for the purpose that God has already given them. You need to call them with the name that That's better than their circumstance. Oh, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Jeff, the group, people noticed. Brother Brother Campbell, I realize it may be a little loud out there, and I know you made an adjustment, but that's fine. I don't care what they hear, but just ease up just a hair. Not much, very little in the monitors. Thank you. Let's give our hand, uh, hand to the media team. They always do such an excellent job. Amen. As Jephthah grew, people noticed that he was strong and courageous. His family noticed it too. And together a fearful community and a vindictive family that didn't want him to have a part of the inheritance because his mama was a harlot. Let me tell you something. It was his daddy's fault that he stopped on the side of a road and went in a tent when he had a wife at home. It wasn't Jephthah's fault. But because he didn't have the same mother, the Bible said the family of the other kids got all together. And they said, hey, we're not going to let him have any of our inheritance. As a matter of fact, we don't like him. He's got a stigma attached to him. And the Bible says that they drove him out. And he had to leave everything that he had lived for and everything he had been raised around. And he was without an inheritance and he went out into the wilderness. And the Bible says that he, he gathered there together with him men who were, were, were vain and, and rough around the edges. And people basically that you were not to trifle with. And they developed a, relation, a, 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 a reputation for being strong and being uh, warriors and, and being people who, that whenever they went and done, you just, you just had to move out of the way because they had authority and they had strength. And the Bible said in the process of time, isn't it interesting how that happens? Trouble came and the family who had earlier rejected him. Once they got in trouble and they had somebody coming against the family, that they came calling for Jephthah. And Jephthah knew it would happen. His name said so. His vindication and help would come from the God or from God. And Jephthah was delivered with a good name. It was a name that was better than his circumstances. And the Bible said in Judges 11 and 5. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said unto Jephthah, Come and be our captain that we may fight with the children of Ammon. Amen. I want to tell you something. They need they didn't want nothing to do with him but there was a time whenever they needed his help I want to tell you something there's people that will point at you and say you'll never amount to anything we don't want you around but I'm telling you you can have strength in the power of your relationship with God because when you're born again by the water and the spirit you're given a name that's above every name it's the name of Jesus and that name is a name better than your circumstance 
That's why I'm so glad we have a family. Amen. That's not necessarily the physical blood that's flowing through our veins. But it's the spiritual blood that ties us all together. And it's applied to us in water baptism through the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. But some of you walked in here tonight, today knowing that you live in a lifestyle of addiction, struggling with histories and things that, uh, that you don't know how to answer for. And the enemies won't let you live it down. People won't let you live it down. They won't allow you to make the change that God wants to make in you. But can I encourage somebody today? Do not accept the identity that the devil has tried to tell you you are. Don't you dare accept the, the name that he's given you. You're not a drug addict. You're not an addict of any kind. You're not a Pressed person. I come against that in the name of Jesus. But you have a name. I said you have a name that's better than your circumstances. And go ahead and claim the promise that Jesus has given you. Right. Yeah. Hallelujah. I tell you right now, you got a calling. You got a purpose. You got a direction. Don't let the enemy stop what God started in your life. Somebody said, well, Brother Burks, I'm already old. It don't matter how old you are. Because there was one that the Bible says was going into the land of Canaan. And he come back and he said, hey, we're well able to take the land. And he was spared until after 40 years when they rejected God. But Caleb said, four score and 20 years ago. Something or whatever it was. I can't remember. He was in his 80s, I believe. He said, I, I said I could, we could do it, and I'm still saying we can do it now. Give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. I don't care how old you are. It may be, seem like it's all over with. God can call you for his purpose when you're 60 years old. It don't matter. Don't, don't accept what the enemy says. It's just a washed up mess. Some of you also never knew about church or this kind of church. And you've recently walked in beginning to feel the anointing and the power of God. And you're wondering if this is where you need to be. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, this is exactly where you need to be. Because the truth is preached here. There's a name preached here that's greater than any other name. You need to wear that name. You need to take on that identity. You are a child of the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, let him come be our captain that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And the Bible says that, that, that Jephthah came back and he found himself with a league with his family. He said, I tell you what, I want to help y'all, but I want, to, I want you to know something. I don't accept that I'm not a part of this family. I want you to know something. I don't accept that I don't have an inheritance. So I'm telling you that if I'm going to help you, you're going to make me the captain of your family. I'll be fair to everybody, but I'm going to walk out of here with an inheritance I'm going to walk out of here with an identity I'm going to walk out of here with a name I don't care what you thought about me I don't care who my mama was I'm telling you I've got power because my, my name means God it's my deliverer God will set me free and because he will set me free and because that's who I am and because that's what my name is, it's going to benefit you. So put me in the service. They said, whatever you say, we'll do it. And the Bible says he led them into war and he delivered his whole family from the onslaught of the enemy. I'm telling you, some of you, you thought you were weak. The devil says you don't have no power. But I'm telling you, you got a name. I said, you got a name that gives you authority and gives you power. You're not just anybody, but you're powerful in the spirit. You're a king. You're a strong man. You're somebody that the devil knows about. Those one group that was trying to cast out devils, they, in the New Testament, the spirits spoke back to them. And they said, Paul, I know. And Jesus, I know. But who are you? I'm telling you, that's a lie from hell. We are going to be known by the enemy. You are going to be known by the enemy. I refuse to accept defeat. Brother Burks, I don't know what I can do. Yes, you can do something. Start by being a prayer warrior. Everybody can pray. 
What am I supposed to do, Brother Burks? Start by finding you an altar of prayer. Brother Burks, I want to be used to God. What, what do you think I can do? I don't have a lot of talents. Start by finding you a fast day in the week. Brother Burks, I, I'd like to be used to do things. Okay, start by being a soul winner. Witness to somebody. Just tell somebody about the good news of Christ. And I'm telling you the man's gift. The Bible says the Lord will make room for it. But even those that don't have any gift in it all. God's not necessarily looking for ability. Uh, our, our ability but he's looking for availability. He'll take your weakness. And in your weakness he will be made strong. you got a name. you got an identity. That's far beyond what you ever were. Hallelujah. I think about some of the testimonies. Friday night we were we were in service with Brother Hennigan in Kirbyville for his 20 year pastoral anniversary. And that night, Brother Smith from Starks, he and the Hennigans have in recent times become friends, and he invited him to come preach his anniversary, and he did a tremendous job. But in the course of him preaching, he was talking about Brother Hennigan being a great pastor and a man of God. And he said, you know, I don't really know all that you were brought out of, but, I, but all I know is what I see in that you got a good man as a pastor. I'm paraphrasing now. But I was standing on that platform when he said those words, and I said to myself under my breath, I know where he was brought from. I know where he came from. And I thought about some of the things that I've conversed with him about. And Brother Hennigan at a time was young and strong and liked to fight. And if you ever shook his hand, it's like this. You can't hardly put your, your hand around his hand because the width of his hand is about like this. And he used to fight and drink. And drug and all of that stuff. And he told me about a fight he got into with your uncle W.L. Hall. And you got to know W.L. <laughs> he was, I don't know how tall he was. And he was just lanky. And he said, Brother Burks, I couldn't get my hands on him. They were at a cafe that used to be there in Bonware. And he said he liked to kick, beat my brains out. Kick me, kick me up underneath the truck. And he said, I did everything in the world. He's like, he liked to kill me. And I don't even know if W.L. even liked to fight very much. I don't know. He was pretty crazy, though. But through the course of living for the world, through the course of living through the enemy, it, the law caught up with him. And he spent, four, I think, four years in a state penitentiary in Louisiana. And it's just an absolute miracle from God that he even got out to start with. And no, he's not happy about it. And no, he's ashamed of it. And yes, and yes, he is. And yes, he don't want to go back to it. But at the same time, I, I look at how God worked in his life. And now when he started off uh, his ministry, the majority of his ministry, Brother, brother uh, Justin, was in the prison. And by the way, our, our prison ministry was in service this morning. And they had 21 present in their service. And Brother Justin reports to me that the power of God fell in that place this morning. He was preaching. He said like the house was on fire. He preached. And I, I'll give it away because he may want to preach it here someday. But when the shepherd became a lamb. And he said he looked up. And there was guards standing in the door listening to him preach. And he, walked, he thought he was needing something. He walked over to him while he was preaching under the anointing. And he said, is there, is there some problem? Do I need to do something? And the guard said, no. I'm just standing here listening to what I hear. And the power of God began to move. And I believe power of God fell in that place and people there was one backslider in service I got a report the other day and said hey do y'all have a prison ministry I said yeah he said do they go to Woodville I said yes he said we have a my, 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 my brother is in prison over there I need to give him his name See what's wrong, Brother Burks? I tell you what's wrong. The world's called them criminals. The world's called them prison. And they may have to serve their time. And I'm not justifying any kind of wrongdoing. But I want to tell you something. There is a place of forgiveness. There is a place of deliverance. There is a place of change where you don't have to be called that anymore. They may be in prison, but they're a child of the king, born again by the water and the spirit. 
You know what? The Bible didn't say that it would always remove the consequences of your wrongdoing. Sometimes you just got to pay the price because you reap what you sow. But everybody can find an altar. Everybody can find a place of repentance because there is a name that's better than your circumstance. I don't care where you come from or what you're doing. God has a purpose for you. And I look at the work in, in Kirbyville and when they went there. That old building, I remember that building, Sister Dalton. You had to be careful when you were walking on it because it had heels on the floor. Every time you moved, it creaked. They didn't even have a fellowship hall. And I look at what God's done and I, they showed a, a, a slide show. And I began to look at the people that were baptized and the home Bible studies that were taught. And I was sitting on the platform with him. And, 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 and he, he said he was very excited because he said it felt like we were just sort of in maintenance mode for a while. You know how that works in churches sometimes. But he said something's happened in the last uh, few weeks. And he said right now I'm teaching a Bible study in my house. And there's six people sitting in my living room every Bible study night. And he's teaching it. And I was thinking about that. None of us are perfect. But oh what a different identity than what the devil wanted him to be. What a different name that he called by now amen I'm telling you you got a purpose I don't care how low you are I don't care how bad it's been there's still hope I said there's still hope there's still hope in Christ Jesus and in the Hebrews hall of faith we find God's heroes and heroines and toward the end sandwiched between the strongest man in scripture And the man whose heart was after God. We find one in Hebrews eleven thirty two. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon. What a name. And Barak. And Samson. And of Jephthah. Of David also. And Samuel. He was numbered in the end with these. With the kind of beginnings. That's what I love about the United States. If we can keep it the United States. And that is anybody's got an opportunity to make whatever they want to out of themselves. if If they can. But it's even greater in the kingdom. Because it does not matter how you were born. It does not matter what your circumstance is. It doesn't matter what your name was. It don't matter if you had a family or not. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that Jesus, the Bible said, went to a cross. And said, I'm going to lay down my own life for all the people of the world. It don't matter who they are there's going to be one drop of blood that's going to be shed for them the stream of blood is going to pour out of my side and it's going to flow down through the centuries and it's going to minister to people that nobody thought they deserved it but I did I did name was better than his circumstances hallelujah I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Come on. Hallelujah. I look all over this building. I, I, I think of Sister, Sister Burks, if you want to come on, I'm not going to preach about it just a little few minutes longer, but I think of Sister Hine back there. You know what, Sister Hine? The devil had done wrote you off. Somebody that knew this truth as a young person. Somebody that even lived in the home of a, of, of a Pentecostal pastor. But yet had turned away and for many years was not living for God. And, the, and, and, and they said, well, and the enemy said, well, I got that, that one taken care of. Uh-huh. 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 Praise God. Uh-huh. Brother Mark, same with you, my friend. Knew this thing, maybe not to the extent that she did when, as a young man. Given the choice, he made what a lot of ch- young people would have chosen and said, I'm going to go do this instead of going to church. God did not intend that, though, for to be your destiny or your identity. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to be filled with His Spirit. You're going to speak with other tongues. And you've already applied that name. That's better than the circumstance. You, he wasn't a bad person at all. He's one of the finest men you'll ever meet. But I'm telling you, God's got another direction and a different purpose for him. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. Come on, Sister Janice. You're the same way. A mom that prayed for you, that you walked away as a teenager 30 years or so. But God said, that's not what my plan is for you. You're not a, you're not a, you're not a loser. You're not lost. But I'm telling you, I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to give you identity. It's not too too late. It's not too late. Mm. Come on. Anybody feel what I'm feeling up here? Praise God. Brother Mike, be very careful about what I say. But I feel like there's a testimony in your life that at some point you're going to be able to talk openly about. It may be even before people or in the midst of others that struggled. I want to be very careful about what I say. When we went to Oklahoma to move him home, he brought out a piece of equipment that was designed for making a substance that we don't need to be making. He said, Brother Burks, what do you think we got to do with this? Because sure can't put it on the trailer and bring it back home. Sure can't cross a state line with three ordained ministers. It's a big old thing. Why do you think he bought property in Oklahoma? There's some legal things up there that he was drawn to. Besides the American dream. Of owning a house and having a creek and a log cabin. Which by the way you have. Whew. Two weeks after he started coming. I stood right here. Or maybe three, three weeks or so, and I had heard a rumor about they're about to move to Oklahoma. The first time he walked in the building, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt God had a purpose. I knew right then and there that it wasn't the will of God for him to move to Oklahoma, but I didn't have the relationship with him that I needed to be able to tell him that. So all I did was say, look, they, they, they brought it up to me right here. And I said, hey, before you completely decide everything let's just there are options here let's don't get in too big of a hurry but after some months later and slowly the relationship did begin to what happened between the pastor the shepherd and the sheep they found themselves in a situation where they were going to have to go and they had already moved a trailer up there they felt like they didn't have no other choice but to move And I told him, I said, y'all listen to me. It's not the will of God. He said, well, Brother Burks, and this is something he brought up. The church is the same everywhere, as long as you believe it. I agree, I agree. that we, there, A lot of people can be saved in a lot of different churches, that's fine. But for what was happening in his life and with his family, it was absolutely not the will of God to walk away from this local assembly. Amen. And I said, I hate to be the one to tell you this because it's hard. Because you want the 22 acres that you purchased. You want the creek that flows through the backside of it that you catch bass out of. You want the log cabin back off the grid and the garden and a lot of other things that we won't mention. It's such a wonderful dream. How 
in the world am, am I, as a pastor, going to stand here and tell you you can't have the dream? The American dream. But I said, I want to tell you something. If you'll obey God, I said, you'll have a cabin. You'll have property. You'll have a pond. You'll have a garden. It may take time, but God's going to honor this commitment. Now, I just talked about these temporal blessings, but my Lord, the spiritual ones, the family, the children, the deliverance, the Holy Ghost, the baptism in Jesus' name, all of that stuff is far greater than any cabin ever thought about being. That's why he said, I'll give it all up, God, just to find the will of God for my family, to change the identity of the future of where my family and my kids are going and the direction of what the enemy wants me to go. We look like a bunch of four or five of our men got together. We loaded trucks and trailers and we drove to Oklahoma and we looked like the caravan of the clampets or something coming back but I said I don't care what we got to do we'll get you a place to park that trailer God's going to open up something you are in the will of God brother and that, not only that they own a piece of property up there he said what am I going to do I've got such a certain amount of money sunk into it and I, I've got a note and everything else I said listen I'll tell you what you do you're going to get there two days ahead of us you walk in that realtor's office and you say you put it up for sale. They gave him a certain amount. The realtor said, oh no, that's too much. They said, this is what we need to get our money back and this is what we feel impressed. It wasn't by too far, but realtor, that's too much. They stuck to their guns. Five days later, an earnest contract was signed. And they went through the up and down process. You know how it goes. They set 14 signing dates. And they make you nearly pull your hair out. But they got out from under that building and they got their money back. I, what I'm trying to tell you is, God had an identity. God has given them a name that is not originally what the enemy thought he had them labeled as. They're not what he intended for them to be, but they are born again by the, by the uh, power of God. They've, been, they've had the name applied through baptism and the delivering power, and it's just the start. I said it's just the start. When people come in broken, when they come in down and tattered by sin, you can't expect them to get right all the way overnight. It takes time and it gets messy but I'm telling you if you'll stay faithful God will give you a name that's better than your circumstance why don't we stand right now as they begin to pray I just want to open these altars right now for somebody that wants to change their destiny for somebody that understands God has put them on a different path if I were you and I needed help I would not walk out of this place tonight until I get deliverance. I wouldn't walk out of this place today until I confirm that my purpose is different from the one that the enemy gave me. Oh, come on, these altars are open. Hallelujah. Church, come on, there's some here that need a, need a deliverance and need a touch from God. Amen. Find somebody to pray with. Right now, hallelujah. In the name of the Lord, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, comes nothing.